Hello and welcome to New York City Atheist Live on Tape, brought to you by New York City Atheist Incorporated. I'm your host, Dennis Horvitz, the David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned. It's Women's History Month, and I can think of no better way of honoring the occasion than by introducing our guest for today, our good friend Margaret Downey, the doyen of the free thought movement. She is here to tell us how women outwitted the church in their fight for the right to vote. Uh, Margaret is perhaps best remembered as the recent past president of Atheist Alliance International, uh, which is the uh, National Atheist Umbrella Organization to which uh, American Atheists, New York City Atheists, Secular Coalition for America, and several other agencies, several other organizations are uh, affiliated. Uh, she's known for organiza organizing the successful 2007 convention in Boston, uh, which I had the great pleasure of attending. Uh, it became known as the Woodstock of Atheism, primarily because uh, the writers who became known as the Four uh, Horsemen of the Apocalypse for Atheism, uh, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris were there. Um, and I guess that was, uh, they started being called the Four Horsemen after that event, so that was, that was a, uh, uh, very much a turning point, I think, uh, in the, the history of atheism. So Margaret is here to explain today how atheists can win the fight for freedom for, uh, from religion by uh, following the example of brave women uh, who fought for their right to vote in, the, in America in, uh, in the late 19th and 20th century. And she will be uh, wearing a, uh, an authentic suffragist's costume. I thought I'd flown back in time. Uh, the suffragist movement used tenacity, strength, and courage to stare down what seemed to be a whole world against them in the beginning especially the churches, and even the Bible was used to quote, uh, was quoted to use as justification against them. Um, so uh, they were arrested, they went to jail, they chained themselves to fences, they were force fed, but they never gave up and they won, and so can we. So today's presentation, uh, Margaret will uh, include authentic photos from the Smithsonian, uh, from the Smithsonian Museum to show the 80-year struggle of suffragettes. Uh, she will tell how the movement was created, how divisiveness over religion came, to, uh, came into play, how religion prevented women from obtaining rights, um, and how the movement overcame their infighting that occurs in every movement, except ours, of course. <laughs> we don't know that. Uh, she will also talk about why women still need to be freed from religion. In most atheist groups, she points out, men outnumber women, though it is believed that women cling to religion more than men do. Uh, ironically, uh, Margaret points out, um, American Atheists was started by a woman, Madeline Murray O'Hare. She's now president of the Free Thought Society and is organizing a convention-oriented umbrella group called Unity, which she hopes will hold its first big event in 2013. And meanwhile, she is traveling throughout the U.S. and she's teaching atheist groups how to deal with the media. So I'd like you to all to join in welcoming our friend, Margaret Downey. And they weren't making much headway. The association, the organization, needed younger people involved. New ideas were needed, ideas that could push the movement forward. And in London, things were happening a little faster women and their supporters were much more militant. The English suffrage movement took aggressive actions and suffragettes demanded more attention. And it was in a London police station that Lucy Burns met Alice Paul. They were both arrested during a suffrage demonstration that was held outside of Parliament. Like the close friendship between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns developed a very powerful friendship. After the two women returned to the United States, they worked with Carrie Capman Chat through the American Women Suffrage Association. But Lucy Burns and Alice Paul were the leaders of their congressional committee. So, in April 1913, Alice Paul co-founded the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, which later evolved into the National Women's Party. Lucy Burns was also the co-founder of that National Americans Party, 
or Women's Party, and she served as the legislative chair headquartered in Washington, D.C. She was also the editor of a weekly journal which was known as The Suffragist. The publication was very helpful in spreading information about the goals of the National Women's Party. It was distributed widely, and Lucy Burns made sure that every politician received one. Back in the early 1900s, it was a tremendous job to write and print a newspaper. But can you imagine doing something like that without the use of a computer or any of our modern day equipment? To circulate the newspaper, Lucy Burns depended upon volunteers to sell the paper and to talk to people about donating to the cause. Before Lucy Burns and Alice Paul left the National Women's Suffrage Association under CAT, they organized a brilliant event to make sure that people would know how serious women were about getting their votes and their rights. In 1913, a huge women's suffrage parade was the talk of Washington, D.C. To get the most attention possible, the parade took place one day before the inauguration of President Wilson. When President Wilson arrived to Washington, D.C. on March 3, 1913, there, was, there were only like a few people there to greet him. And he asked, where is everybody? They said, at the parade. Five to 8,000 suffragists marched on Pennsylvania Avenue, and the street was lined with thousands of people. It was a rainy day, but nothing would deter the parade or the message that the suffragist wanted to send. Now, at the front of the march was lawyer Inez Mulholland Bozavain. She led the way on her white horse. Now, she died three years later delivering a speech about the women's suffrage movement. She had tuberculosis and it went untreated because she had such a passion for the movement. The parade was organized with marchers in all types of groups. There were suffragists who threw flower petals and some carried handmade signs and many of the women arrived with literature to distribute. Now I'm going to play a suffragist song that's synchronized to parade pictures. So bear with me as I turn the music on. Tom, wait till you hear the music.
Isn't that a great parade? <laughs> well, oh, I, I think we should give them a hat, even though they can't hear us. But <laughs> now, some angry men shouted nasty insults. Others threw lighted cigarette butts at the suffragists. Some men spit at the women as they marched by and others slapped them and mobbed them and beat them and the police did nothing to protect the women from their attackers. Army troops were called in to stop the violence. 200 marchers were seriously injured. The next day, the inauguration proceeded, but public outcry against the police and their failure to protect the parade marchers resulted in the investigation of the District Columbia commissioners and the police chief was fired. But most importantly, the sympathy generated by the abuse gained support for the cause for women's suffrage and for women's rights. Black suffragists participated in the parade. Now keep in mind that the year was 1913 and there was a lot of prejudice against women, particularly African American women. In order to prevent creating an even more opposition to women getting the right to vote in the South, most of the black suffragists agreed to march in the back of the parade. Ida B. Wells, the organizer of the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago and co-founder of the National Association for Colored Women, took members of her group to Washington, D.C to participate in the parade. Ida B. Wells was furious at the thought that the black suffragists were asked to walk in the back of the parade. And she simply could not and would not do that. As the parade progressed, Ida B. Wells emerged from the crowd and joined the Illinois delegation marching between two white suffragists. She denied segregation and she defied the rules and I think that she was one of the most brave women in the movement. Two months later another parade took place in New York City. On May 10, 1913, 10,000 marchers, one in 20 of whom were men, paraded down Fifth Avenue. Four years later, in 1917, the state of New York finally gave the women the right to vote. And that was the same year that the United States of America declared war in Germany. Now just like the Civil War interfered with the fight for women to get their votes, so did the war in Europe. The general attitude was that women should support the troops and leave their issues behind. Some anti-suffrage men started to print literature of their own. And on the screen, you see a copy of a postcard and a poster that was circulated just to scare people. The woman who is a mother and stays at home is drawn as pretty and loving. The woman who's a suffragist is drawn as ugly and sick and very scary. And suffragist people also tried to promote the idea that it was not patriotic for women to want to work or to get the vote. They distributed literature saying that the real suffragist worked at home as her husband went off to fight the war. And this is the type of rhetoric and propaganda that women had to endure and fight against. Most men, attitudes began to change and many more supporters came forward to help women obtain the right to vote. Now in this photo, you see many men supporters the country was very much divided over these, this issue and it was very difficult for most men to admit that they actually did support the women's rights to vote. More and more states began to allow women their rights, but it was a very, very slow process. And women who lived in states that would not allow them to vote felt cheated and angry. And I'm sure you'd feel that way too, knowing that people just like you were treated differently just because they happened to live in a different state that finally understood the importance of women's rights.
can't move. You have your home, your family in the state that you're stuck with. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, the two ladies who organized the big Washington, D.C. women's suffrage parade, decided that desperate actions were needed in order to get the Constitution of the United States of America to am amend itself to include women's rights. They opened an office in Washington, D.C. They made huge banners, flyers, posters. They made flags at that location, and they visited politicians. They confronted them on the Capitol steps if they could not get into the congressional offices. And they sang suffragette songs in mass on the steps of Congress. Well, that's just a small sample of what kind of songs they sang. Now, these desperate actions were not enough because people still used the excuse that a war was going on and there was no time to address women's rights issues. The suffragists noticed that President Wilson was deliver delivering speeches about freedom and democracy, yet women in their very own country were not free and could not participate in the democratic process. That is when they decided to pick up the White House every single day. It would be impossible for President Wilson to ignore them as he traveled back and forth from his residence. The women had given up on getting the attention of Congress. They now targeted their efforts towards appealing to President Wilson. Rain or snow, the women appeared in groups, conveying their message in any way they could. Some days were almost unbearably cold, but the women were determined to get the attention of the president. They used the president's own words on their banners and posters pointing out that the war was protecting citizens of Germany, while American women couldn't even vote. The year was 1917, and by this time, more and more women had received college degrees and were holding jobs. Not only did women want the vote, but now they wanted to be paid equally as men. Women were also working on the battlefield during the war. They risked their lives, yet they were paid less and couldn't vote. Tensions were building, and more and more women joined the fight for women's suffrage. Almost every day, the suffragists who picketed the White House were harassed by police and passersby. They held strong, however, never giving way to the abuse. On November 10, 1917, an angry crowd of men attacked the suffragists. A riot broke out. Instead of arresting the men who started the riot, the police arrested the suffragists. 41 suffragists were charged with obstructing traffic. Some suffragists were only given a fine of $25. Now, $25 was a lot of money in 1917. Today, that would be the equivalent of about $300. The women who paid the fines were released, but most of the suffragists refused to pay the fine. A total of 16 suffragists refused to pay. They claimed that they were unjustly arrested for exercising their right to protest and claimed that they too had freedom of speech. They were sentenced to 60 days hard labor in Occupan, I don't know how to pronounce that very well, Occupan Workhouse. That's in Virginia. It's an Indian word. 
When the women arrived to the prison, 40 prison guards wielded clubs and went on a rampage against the women. The warden had ordered his guards to teach the suffragists a lesson. The wardens and the guards felt justified in abusing the women because they thought it was unpatriotic to picket the President of the United States, especially to picket in front of the sacred White House. They beat Lucy Burns. They changed, chained her hands to the cell bars above her head, and they left her hanging for the night, bleeding and gasping for air. The guards hurled another suffragist, Dora Lewis, into a dark cell. They smashed her head against an iron bed, and they knocked her out cold. Her cellmate, Alice Cousy, thought that Dora had died, and Alice Cousa suffered a heart attack because of what she saw. Later, it would be discovered that the guards grabbed, dragged, beat, choked, slammed, pinched, twisted, and kicked all the women that were in prison that day. And that horrible first night in prison on November 5, 1917, was called the Night of Terror. For weeks, the women only had water to drink from an open pail. And they found their food was infested with worms. And they were cold, and they were hungry, and they were isolated from the world. The world did not know what was happening to them in prison. The suffragists who were not in prison continued the protests and the picketing. They bravely held vigils, demanding that their comrades be set free. The suffragists continued to hand out literature, and more and more young people started to support the rights for women. The suffragists would not be silenced and would not be forced away from protest efforts taking place in front of the White House, even though it was a time of war. Suffragists and leader Alice Paul had not been arrested on November 5th in 1919. She decided to do something drastic. She printed what President Woodrow Wilson's words on paper, and then she burned them in a pot that the suffragists who picketed in front of the White House used to keep warm. That action was thought to be overtly unpatriotic, and it caused another riot in front of the White House. And during that riot, Alice Paul was arrested for obstructing traffic. She was unjustly sentenced to six months of hard labor and sent to the same prison, whose name I can't pronounce, <laughs> to join the other suffragists. After seeing the mistreatment of her sister suffragists, Alice Paul called for a hunger strike. The jailers were concerned that word would get out that the suffragists that were in prison were dying of malnutrition. So they devised a very terrible way in order to feed the, the women. And what they did was they forced fed. And in order to determine when the stomach was full, the jailers fed the women until regurgitation actually took place. And liquids such as raw eggs was poured down a tube until the stomach was full. And when the stomach was full, that's when you knew to stop. The women were tortured. They were tortured for weeks with this forced feeding. Because when the lips became damaged by the forced feeding through the mouth, the tube was placed inside the nose. And then when the nose was damaged, it would go back to the mouth. The tube caused tremendous damage to the throat, the esophagus, and the stomach. And forced feeding is torture. It did not help matters when the suffragists who did not approve of picketing the White House during wartime started calling themselves the law-abiding suffragists. It made it seem like the suffragists in prison actually deserved to be there. So do you see how important it is for everyone concerned 
to be aware of mistreatment, especially for those who are fighting for your same cause. Finally, Alice Paul was able to smuggle a message to the press. This mistreatment and the forced feeding were finally highlighted in the Washington Post. So finally, the world discovered what was happening to the suffragists in prison. The public outrage over the mistreatment pushed the district court to overturn all of the sentences. The arrests were deemed invalid, and in total, 200 suffragists had served time for obstructing uh, traffic. Even though the subject was very serious, some cartoonists made light of the situation. And on the screen, you see a very rare cartoon showing a fat suffragist in prison refusing to eat. So when she loses all her weight by refusing to eat, she can fit in between the prison bars and go escape and return to fighting for women's rights. The truth is that when the women were finally released, some could barely walk. They were seriously ill and needed immediate medical help. After their release from prison, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns began working on a ratification banner. They had hopes that the ratification and the passage of the 19th Amendment would finally give women the right to vote. 